everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today for episode 14 of season three of Revise and Resubmit. I'm Dr. Kim Bissell, the Southern Progress Endowed Professor in Magazine Journalism and the Associate Dean for Research in the College of Communication and Information Sciences at the University of Alabama. And I'm Dr. Annalisa Bowen, an Assistant Professor in the Department of Communication Studies, also at the University of Alabama, and we both work in the Institute for Communication and Information Research, or the ICIR, at UA. So let's be real, it's going to be a little challenging <laughs> spoilers into, uh, in our introduction of today's guest. Suffice it to say, we have a really fun conversation coming. But I do have an initial question for you, Kim, and that is, what is your most noteworthy positive interaction with an athlete? And what is your most noteworthy negative interaction with an athlete? And you don't have to say which is which, although maybe we'll be able to guess. Okay, so as a former sports photographer, I've had many interactions with athletes, but I would have to say many of them were unintended. <laughs> um, so I think this example may fall into the, both categories because my most noteworthy interaction was when I was covering Florida Gator football as a member of the sports information team. And I was on the sidelines taking pictures of Emmett Smith busting it down the field. However, my long lens that I was using didn't quite give me the right perspective in terms of how far away he was. And I basically got tackled by Emmett Smith after he got tackled by a defensive player. <laughs> So I was flattened on the field and my camera lens whacked me in the head. So definitely not a positive interaction. However, the positive interaction came when he held out his hand to help me up. And truth be told, I wasn't sure I could get up. Wasn't sure I could move, but I was on national TV and all the cameras were focused on me and I absolutely knew it. So I was like, all right, I got to play it out. I got to stand up even if I can't move. So I really want to know about you. Have you been tackled by a football player? Zero. Zero times. Uh, <laughs> but I have had just a couple interactions. We'll talk about one of them later. But I also vividly remember, and vivid is a little bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> I remember being on a plane going somewhere and Vince Sanderson was also on the plane and, and was pointed out to me. And I was like, Oh my gosh. So he was an Alabama basketball coach who always wore plaid jackets, also on the plane. And I think I am, <laughs> but I was like, oh my gosh, there's Lynn Sanderson. And side note, as a very young child at Allen Field House, that's Lawrence, uh, Kansas, home of the Jayhawks, kids would be invited to go down to the court at like halftime and dance around. Um, and I was too shy to do that. My life could be totally different if I had been like a, halftime on the court <laughs> four-year-old dancer um, <laughs> anyway, um, back to that athlete interaction I had that one-way interaction with Clint Sanderson I don't think I've ever had a negative a interaction with an athlete um, but I could I could go on and on when I was in college where my friends was a huge basketball fan for her birthday we went to an Alabama basketball practice ask the players to sing happy birthday like on a VHS camcorder <laughs> it, it was magical okay I'm done athletes rock roll tide back to today's episode yeah yes today we talked with a sport communication scholar one of our most recent CNIS alum who despite being in another institution still says roll tide roll tide to that please <laughs> give join us in giving a very warm welcome to Dr. Sam Hakeem an instructor in the College of Behavioral, Social, and Health Sciences at Clemson University. Thank you so much for joining us today, Sam. We are thrilled to be able to catch up with you. Thank you so much. I am excited to be here. Uh, I'm very honored to be invited back to the podcast or invited to the podcast and invited to be with some of my favorite people in the department. Yay! <laughs> okay, so Sam, you're in your first semester in an academic job at a new institution. Tell us the best part of your job and the best part of the new city, or tell us about something surprising. Okay, 
Wow, we're jumping right into it. I like it. So <laughs> I'm at Cle- <laughs> I'm at Clemson University. Um, we'll say Roll Tigers for now, a little half and half. <laughs> um, I I think my favorite part of the job is honestly so far. I mean, I've only been here for a few months. Like you said, it's my first semester. My favorite part is really just like meeting the new faculty. Um, or I, I should say meeting the faculty that are already there. I'm the new guy in town. Uh, meeting, the, <laughs> meeting the faculty, um, learning about what they do and what their expertise areas are and, you know, learning about their method and their methods and how they work through issues. And I really enjoy like, the people element. That's always been my favorite thing about um, academics. So it's no surprise to me that my favorite thing so far has been learning about the people and also learning the students, like, you know, being at uh, UA for three years, I, I had a lot of students that I knew really well, and I had a lot mm-hmm. of students that um, I would see in my rosters. I'd be like, oh, I've had them before. But first semester, it felt really weird. It was like walking into the cafeteria at like a high school for like the first time in like ninth grade. <laughs> and you're like, who are all these people? So uh, that's been my favorite sit? part so far. Yeah. yeah, seriously. I'm like, are they going to accept me? So um <laughs> this has been probably the most fun and exciting part of like being at a new place is just like learning about the people and the students for sure. That's great. That's awesome. So let's uh, move into a little bit more about you and we're going to do a quick questions here. So first, uh, can you tell us where you're from or where you grew up? Sure. Uh, So this podcast goes on for about 12 hours because that's how much time I'm going to need for the answer. (laughs) So um, I was born in New York. I moved to Florida and I lived in Florida for the most, the the bulk of my childhood from about a few months old to about 15 years. Uh, Moved back to Long Island, uh, finished high school in Long Island and Long Beach, Long Island. And then I went to the University of Buffalo for my undergraduate and my master's degree starting in 2010. Um, I worked for two years outside of academics in between my master's program and UA for my PhD uh, in Buffalo. Uh, it's where I met my, my wife-to-be. Um, and so I consider Buffalo to be very much like my home away from home. It's my, it's my home base. It's where a lot of my, um, my professional, uh, original professional academic contacts are. And one of my largest mentors in my life, I call him my academic dad. I'll give Tom <laughs> Feely my, 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 my shout out here. Um, so, you know, Buffalo is very much home to me. A lot of my friends are here. So I would say Buffalo is where I am from. Um, and I think a lot of that is like academic and obviously what I do now and being an academic. So that's meaningful to me. So you talked about moving around a lot during all these different moves. What did the young Sam think he would be doing when he grew up? Did you always have a a vision that you would be a professor and in academia? Uh, Absolutely not. Um, So (laughs) (laughs) I'll be very honest in that. Some people are fortunate enough to know exactly what they're doing uh, by, it seems like, middle school. And they stick to their guns and they go with it. I was uh, not that case. I was always kind of the one who was concerned about what am I going to be doing uh, in my life? And that was something that I was kind of concerned about when I was an undergrad. And uh, it's it's kind of a big reason why I went to a master's program. And that's sort of where Tom Feely kind of jumps into the story is I I had him for a class uh, called Persuasion. It was an upper level class at UB. It was one of my favorite classes that I took. Um, His way of teaching was just so different and so unique. He was such a pro um it was really inspiring he was just so charismatic in the classroom I was like wow like I'm like gravitating towards this person and you know up to this point like I've had like friends professional friends but I wouldn't say that I had like a mentor Mm -hmm. um so I got to know Tom a little bit more and I was active in the classroom which is something that I've always had kind of as a characteristic and um I got to know him more and you know it got to a point where we were discussing what are the next steps for Sam after graduating (laughs) I said I really don't have a plan (laughs) And he was like, well, have you ever considered, you know, grad school? And, you know, I, I guess he saw something in me, saw a good student. And, uh, you know, I, I said, I never really thought about it, but I, I have zero interest, Tom, in doing any research at all, ever. Oh. Um, and Tom was like, okay, we'll see about that one. So <laughs> I I, t- I took my uh, GRE. I, I got into UB for a communication master's program. Uh, Tom was my advisor. I told him explicitly again, Tom, please don't make me do any research. I'm here for the applied program. Don't hurt me. Uh, and a couple months later, he was like, good news. I got you a, a research assistant position. I was like, okay, oh my I guess I'm going to do research now. Um, and I'm sure as y'all are aware, like, you know, re- like full research positions as a master's student are pretty rare, hard to come mm-hmm. by, especially 
at a university with a PhD program. Yeah. Right. Um, so having that was very special. I didn't realize how special that was at the time. Um, but obviously reflection and, you know, looking back and seeing I am now, it was so impactful for me um, that, you know, it really sort of changed the course of where I was going. And it's funny because I remember when I was in high school, um, I was talking to a friend of mine and she was like, you know, you would make a great teacher. And I said, that's a good one. I never want to do that. So um, <laughs> I, I ended up working for two years of Afro master's program because I was still, you know, this, this hell bent, you know, anything with that. academics. And I was like, the real, the real world kind of stinks. Uh, so I, <laughs> I, had, I, I had been friendly to this point uh, with Darren Griffin. Uh, who we all know and love and Darren and I had been close and been friendly since 2010 ironically uh, I met him well before Tom uh, Darren was in his first semester of a PhD program and I was in my first semester as an undergraduate and Darren was the TA for my Com 101 and uh, he had notoriously called me out for not knowing a word while giving a presentation to oh, which I said no. I'll show you <laughs> So I ended up taking his comm theory class and I guess like that's like where the story really begins is I took Darren's comm theory class and he goes, what's your major? And I was a business major at the time as an undergrad. And I, I said, oh, I'm a business major. And he goes, we'll see. And I was like, why do these people know what's going on in my life and not me? So uh, yeah, long story short, I, I met Andy Billings in 2015 on a road trip to see Darren in, in Alabama and uh, with another uh, uh, alum, Zach Arf, and I met Andy, kept the connection going. And then about 2017, midway, I, I'd reached out to Darren. I said, you know what? I'm kind of sick of the real world. Uh, I, miss, I miss school. I want to be around the people that I want to be around. And at that point, I felt like I had a direction in my life. And that was like, so yeah, kind of a weird story. Some people know they want to be a researcher young. And it was not for me early on. So... <laughs> for this, but for people who don't or, or aren't in the field, um, they may not kind of pick up on on the scholars that you've mentioned and, and the differences in their areas of research, but they are. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask you, what is your area of scholarship? Can you give us an elevator pitch on that? Yeah, absolutely. So I look at the three dispositions of sport, which is this applied, uh, this communication studies approach, and the Mrs. Masscom area of sports that Larry Wenner lines out. Um, and I looked at these pillars of sports, and I said, you know what, everyone's most most scholars in our field of sport communication look heavily at this um, mass comm approach. Obviously, mass communication is such an important part, and I'm not trying to knock that, but. Uh, we have the applied approach, which is, you know, a lot of this practitioner view, working in public relations, being able to be a communications professional. Uh, and then you have this communication studies approach. So my area, and a quick, uh, a quick sum up, is the interpersonal interactions between athletes and fans. And for me, it's this area of research that I was inspired by, by my own interactions with athletes. Um, and it's really seeing how fans evolve. Uh, change and see how their behaviors and attitudes change after having these interactions with athletes. Um, and it doesn't need to necessarily be like a, a LeBron James or a Wayne Gretzky. It could be really any athlete that the person sort of feels like they identify with or resonate. So uh, stripping back this idea of sport communication, really I'm looking at how identity plays a factor into people's lives uh, from an interpersonal standpoint. Okay. But so first favorite athlete interaction, go. Yes, 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 oh, that's God. my question. Ne okay, okay. I'll give you a negative and a positive because just because <laughs> they're favorite doesn't mean they necessarily have valence. So oh, I'll give okay. you a negative and a positive favorite. So I'll do negative and then I'll do positive. I'll, I'll end with a happy. So favorite negative, I was about 10, 11 years old. I was in New York City on a trip with my grandmother. This, I'm still living in Florida at this time. Um, and that's, that's an important part of the story. So my grandma and I, were, we're both coming from Florida to visit New York. Um, and we're walking around New York City, and out from around the corner comes Dan Marino. Oh, God. Now I'm going to put Dan Marino on blast on a podcast. So, <laughs> hey, he, he, br he brought this among himself, okay? He, 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 he made this decision. So uh, he pulls around the corner. My grandmother, being the outspoken woman that she is, goes, Dan Marino, we're from Florida. And he kind of like turned around and gave us a little nod. And she goes, anyway, we could get a, 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 an autograph. And he turns around. He goes, yeah, it's five dollars. <gasps> um, for anyone who doesn't know who Dan Marino is, he's a Hall of Fame quarterback. <laughs> um, he owns car dealerships. I don't 
I mean, listen, I'm not Dan Marino's financial consultant, but I, it, I would be hard to believe that $5 is going to make or break his day. Uh, and signing an autograph for a 10 year old. I mean, like, it's not like I'm some Aww. eBay scalper. So, so he said no. And it totally turned me off from my fan identity of like living in Florida and like this fanship towards the dolphins or towards him. Um, and this idea of like fanship, by the way, I like break it down for listeners who may not be aware. Like this idea of like fanship is like an affinity towards a team or an organization or a league. Whereas fandom is a lot of this, uh, this community feeling that you have with other fans. So fanship is looking at sort of this entity and fandom is looking at a community and they both kind of come together to make this fan identity, this total fan identity. So anyways, um, he said, no, I was like, I hate the dolphins and I hate you, Dan Marino. <laughs> and that's my negative interaction that I love to use in my stories. And I've probably blasted him like too publicly, but one day my goal is that he'll reach out to me and we'll be able to have like a conversation together. Right. And he'll be like, you're oh, the guy who's been yeah. blowing me up. And I'm like, oh, wow, it got around finally. <laughs> um, and then my favorite, my favorite positive interaction was I was working with the Buffalo Sabres. I was interning with them. This is a 2015, 2016 season. And I was uh, working just like a, a community event at a bowling alley, just, you know, doing some extra stuff, being a good intern, you know what they say, be active. Um, and I was going down the stairs and coming up the stairs was the current captain of the Sabres, Brian Gianta. And I'm, we're, we're crossing paths and he looks at me, he goes, oh, hey, Sam. And I was like, hi, Brian Gianta, captain of the Buffalo Sabres. Like, <laughs> how do you know my name? And apparently Brian Gianta was the type of player who liked to know everyone around him. So again, a very uh, happy, positive interaction. I was really taken aback by his, um, his just his, his interpersonal and his immediacy and just the fact that he wants like know other people's names. Like he doesn't have to, like he's an established NHL player and he's retired now, but you know, that really caught me off guard. And I will say to that point, I never really thought, and this is nothing against Brian Gianta, but like speaking objectively, like on his, like his performance as a hockey player, he's a great captain, but he was never like the best player on the team, like point wise. So there were times where I was critical of Brian Gianta, especially when we had him, he was a little older, but I will say after that positive interaction, I was much less, you know, intense or harsh on him. I was like, what a nice guy. It doesn't even mm -hmm. matter if he's not that great of a player. Like what a good person. So it changed my fan identity. And I think that's a lot of where my interest stems from. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, there thank you. <laughs> so many, so many follow up questions here. Right. <laughs> um, but one question that I just have to ask, because what you, what you've described so far is just fascinating in terms of fanship and fan identity. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to come up with a headline for one of your more interesting findings. Okay. One of the more interesting findings I had, let me think of a headline. <laughs> I like, it's so simple and it's like so silly, but it's just like players matter. Like that's the, that's the pre colon headline is like, okay. on like a research article, like players matter. Like cool. uh, we've, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of research out there about fan origins and where does fan identity stem from and, uh, a lot of credit is given to family, fathers get a specific uh, sort of like stick tap head nod uh, when it comes to like building fan identity, um, friends, geographical location of like where you live. So like if you live in Boston, you're probably a Red Sox fan or a Patriots fan or a Bruins fan. Um, obviously, there are places like Boston as compared to like Indianapolis that maybe have, and I don't want to insult anyone in Indianapolis, but like, it just seems like Boston has like such an international reputation for being a sports city mm -hmm. that like for someone, it's sort of hard to ignore, but recent research has shown that players have had larger impact on the sort of fan identity development. Uh, Melnick and Juan, and now you're putting me on the spot for a year. It's got a, it's, it's 2011, I think. Um, they were looking at how, uh, a sample in Australia where adapting to a new team and what we saw or not, we saw what Melnick and Juan saw was that players had a larger impact than what they have seen previously. Uh, and previously it went to those other uh, elements that I had mentioned, like family geogra uh, geography. So I was fascinated by this and I wrote a paper in Dr. Andy Billings's class, which is published in IJSC uh, international journal sport communication and it's about the Premier Lacrosse League, which is a league with no geographical ties. So now we're totally void of like this, oh, I'm from New York, so I'm a big fan of the Yankees sort of thing. Um, and 
it's a new leagues with new teams that are arbitrarily named. So teams names are like chaos or whip snakes <laughs> or uh, redwoods. Like they have no meaning to people uh, unless you're like a, a lacrosse fan, in which case, you know, you may you know, like whip snakes. It's like the whip of like a, a lacrosse stick uh, chaos. The game is kind of chaotic. So they kind of have like these descriptor names, but there's no geographical ties. They play a 14 week season, about 14 weeks where they travel to neutral locations. And I'm like, how the heck are fans, how the heck are people becoming fans? Like, new league, new teams, new lineups, no cities. What is going on? So I ran the study and I ran a survey and I, um, I, I, I sampled lacrosse fans from Reddit, lacrosse forums. And it turns out that these players are largely impactful on where fans have placed their, their flagpole on these teams when they first sort of uh, developing. And I felt that similarity myself, and this is why my headline is Players Matter, is because I like lacrosse. I didn't know where to go and lie my fan identity. But when I saw the rosters, this one team called Chaos Lacrosse Club, Club uh, they had many players from the Buffalo Bandits lacrosse team, which is a different league, indoor league. And I was like, oh, well, that's easy. I'll be a fan of the Chaos. They have a lot of players that I'm familiar with, and they're from Buffalo. So I had this like weird sort of like quasi geographical tie, but players that I was familiar with. And that's where my fan identity went. Turns out a lot of fans are doing the same thing. They would follow players from college uh, and be individual fans. There's one player in the league named Ryder Garnsey, who's like this bad boy. He like was disqualified from like his last season because his <laughs> grades weren't good. So like he kind of fits like this cultural lacrosse mold, but he's like an unbelievable athlete. Like he's disgusting on the field. Like he's so good, but like fans were, became fans of his team because of him. Uh, and then what happens and what I think is happening is that fans, once they like stake a claim in a team for a player, the idea is like kind of like a tree. They'll start growing roots into this team for other reasons, mm -hmm. but the players matter. So back to the title. I think, I, yeah. I mean, I think, it, it, interestingly, so I, I grew up in Tuscaloosa and I remember like, uh, you ha of course you have to be a Bama fan, right? That's just <laughs> what you're, what you are. Um, That's but religion. I, it's religion. Right. But I remember, like, I remember in elementary school and I don't, I don't know the exact, I don't remember the context, but Robert Ori like was at my elementary school and I don't, I don't know, I don't know why, um, but I, <laughs> I, and I'm a basketball fan too. I I was raised on that, but like I got an autograph on a t-shirt. I still have it. And like, that's, that's who I remember. And that just like, not solidified, but like made it even more important and like a connection there. Like, right. Because I'm a six-year-old with, with, like, with a <laughs> deep connection now to Robert Ory. Um, but I felt like. Hey, I, that's, that's what happens. Yeah, it deepened my my fandom and my fan identity as not only just a Bama fan, but a Bama basketball fan. Roll Tide. For sure. And it's shout out Robert Ori. He makes so many rap song appearances, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> Rappers love dropping Robert Ori references. But I think it's awesome how you brought up that like that was so impactful for you because I feel like as a kid, and you said you were six years old, like it's yeah. hard for six year olds to understand like the the institution that are professional leagues or the institution is the NCAA. And then the understanding of like how teams operate and rules and the players are like this foundational piece or like the easiest thing to, to watch as a young child. You just like, you hone in on these players because they work this magic on the field or you have these experience with them. Like you had where the, he came in and was signing autographs. But like, I, I feel logically as a kid, it's easier to leech onto a player than anything else. I mean, other than like, you know, I'm three years old and my favorite color is red. So roll right. tide or I like a mascot. So, you know, mm -hmm. roll tide, big Al. But uh, <laughs> I think for kids, like players are like an idolization factor. And there's research out there about how we look up to athletes as role models, both on the court or on the, on the ice and out in public. So I think you had a really um, influential moment there for sure. Okay. So I have 37 follow-ups, but I'm going to try to keep it to one or two. <laughs> 
Um, okay, so you were talking about this road trip that you took with your grandma um, and the interaction with Dan Marino, and then you kind of fast forward to where we are now and the way kids grow up and the way that they see athletes and professional teams and collegiate teams and all of that. A lot of it is through a mediated lens. Now, I mean, yeah. in Tuscaloosa, kids have the opportunity to go to football games and watch the, you know, the team walk in on the, the walk of champions and all of that. But for the most part, the interaction is not, um, is not two way and that you're super lucky. So what I'm wondering, Sam, is how much now do other types of media like social media play a role in this development of a fandom and fanship and identity and the way that we are drawn to or maybe not drawn to specific athletes and I'm just asking you to it doesn't have to be based on what you've done in research I'm just curious what you think no that's a great question and if I get off on like different tangents and I need to be brought back down to earth please do because you've given me a large topic to sort of springboard off of. So <laughs> when it comes to social media, obviously, I think people are like, I, I couldn't even imagine being a child nowadays. And I'm thankful that I did not grow up with the internet in my hand at all points and times, because it would just be so confusing. So first of all, <laughs> uh, I don't know how, how young people are doing it today. And I say that as someone who is turning 30, I feel so disconnected at times from my students because they have been, they were born with a phone in their hand. I had one student tell me the other day that they're 17 and I almost cried in class. Um, so going back to the point here of the internet and the impact of like social media. So I recently did like this little like uh, research presentation for some other academics, just kind of like a small one. And I talked about the importance of like this interpersonal connection, which is my research area. And I, and I say this because when we look at these dispos dispositions of sport, while social media can literally bring you into the helmet of these athletes mid-game, there's still this invisible wall. There's still this breakup between the interpersonal interaction and having this mediated interactions. And obviously, there's these important concepts like parasocial that I love, and I talk mm -hmm. about that in these one-way uh, relationship developments that occur and of course with social media and players being younger now also and them being more social media savvy we're seeing more I think uh, interaction on social media whether it's players responding or players liking commenting retweeting whatever they're going to do but I still think there's something about this interpersonal uh, interaction this interpersonal moment that makes it just feel that much more real and I'm wondering and I'm curious is if the more we rely on social media I wonder if it makes the interpersonal interaction that much more special mm -hmm. because it feels that much more rare mm -hmm. um, I think social media though is a great way to introduce uh, children will say at the appropriate age for social media because I do <laughs> think that exposure to social media at a young age is can be concerning yep. um but i do think that like social media exposure for children and is like inevitable but i do think it allows them to see into players lives and especially nowadays that we're seeing more and more awesome disclosure about athletes and their struggles with mental health they're actually mm -hmm. struggling through life issues family issues career issues you know it doesn't even have to be something so personal it could just be like i'm struggling uh, to find a team and I'm going to speak outwardly about it. We have this whole breakup between Jack Eichel and the Sabres that was discussed a sickening, a sickeningly large amount for the last nine months and to the point where it's hurt me as a fan. But, you know, social media allows for that fandom, that community growth. Uh, it also allows for us to see insight into maybe some organizational processes, which is fantastic. So, I don't want to come on the podcast and be like Sam Hakim hates mediated conversations between <laughs> athletes and fans. No, 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 no. That's not the case at all. I love the conversations that people are having because I think you are being brought and exposed into this world that was once incredibly limited. I mean, I think about my, you know, playing fantasy sports, even when I was in my young teenage years and, you know, the fact that I could, like, tweet at them. Like, one time I was playing a fantasy game, and I was like, I tweeted out a player. I was like, hey, are you going to play this weekend? And they wrote back, yes. And I was like, 
perfect. I don't even need to look at the look at the news articles. I know my guy's playing this weekend. So <laughs> obviously a very unique situation. But, you know, the fact that we have this interaction, this ability to interact is so incredible. And it brings people so close to the game. But I will say that I think this fourth wall exists. And this idea of the fourth wall is uh, traditionally used for like performances. You have the actors on stage and you have the audience in their seats. So we have this sort of symbolic nonverbal uh, relationship going on where you are sitting and watching and they are standing and performing. And then you have the tangible curtain that keeps you separate during uh, intermissions or before and after the show. And I feel like social media is very much a representation of that nowadays and that we could get very close, but we can't exactly reach out and touch them. Mm -hmm. So having that interpersonal interaction that could happen serendipitously I think it's like a holy cow moment for fans when they see them in life and they just see it could be nonverbal and physical. And you see like how big they are, how tall yeah. they are, how strong yeah. they are. Yeah. And it could also just be like, wow, like they're a nice person. Like they're genuine. And there have been times where I, you know, in my dissertation, I asked people about interactions and they would say that, you know, I thought this person was going to be, you know, insert negative. And it turns out that they were a very kind human being, even though the media has portrayed them as a negative person. So um, you do see a lot of opinions on social media, which is obviously you need to be careful about. And there is additional dramatization that happens with the media and people who are maybe out to make a stink about something. But there's something said about meeting that person in real life and really getting a, a flavor of who they are. Mm -hmm. Sorry, that was long. No, <laughs> no, 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 no that, that's great. Okay, so I want to shift maybe a little bit. And okay. one of the things that I'm now thinking about with respect to like fandom and um, back to like kind of being a fan of a, of a player. So w what happens to like professional athletes or college athletes too? Like, are, are they fans of a team because <laughs> you switch around or do like where right. where does their fandom I don't know if this has been studied where does their fandom lie and I mean I could ask you that too right you're now at a um d different institution where does your <laughs> <laughs> fandom lie with respect to like you're you're being roll tiger oh, I can't say that roll <laughs> yeah don't do that it doesn't sound good coming out of you <laughs> you know, like how does, how does that work? Um, I, I, do athletes are are they fans of players of or fans of teams? Does it change as they are, grow into professional roles, get traded, go elsewhere? I, I don't know if that's a question or a comment. <laughs> I think the three of us have a study on our hands, is what we're getting at here, because I'm not necessarily <laughs> sure if athletes have been interviewed about their own personal fan identity which is like a super fascinating thing to think about but i guess i could speak from like my exposure of just being a big sports fan in general and like seeing different um conversations unfold and different you know trades and things that move in the nhl just recently and i'll talk on like the jack eichel issue so for listeners who may not be aware jack eichel was the most recent captain of the buffalo sabers he was our perennial generation number one center um <clears throat> excuse me and um, there were some team uh, disagreements. Uh, it involved an injury on his part. And uh, just last week, the Sabres had formally traded him to the Las Vegas Golden Knights. Uh, and it was, a, it was kind of a large to-do in the Buffalo community. And so I think to answer your question, or to go back to it, because there's so much here... <laughs> I do believe that athletes have a fan identity. I do also believe that a lot of professional athletes think differently than fans. And I feel this way for an experience that I had and that's resonated with me. So when I was a freshman at UB, I, for some reason, was on a floor with a lot of D1 athletes, both women's soccer and men's baseball and um there was a lot of athletes on my floor for some reason. And I would, I was a big fan of soccer, like watching soccer. And I would always ask people like, Hey, y'all want to watch some soccer on Saturdays? And they would all <laughs> say the same thing. No, I hate watching. I hate watching soccer. I'm like, but you play soccer. I don't understand. <laughs> and I think for them, it was just like, they were overwhelmed by it. Cause it was just, it would consume their lives 24 seven because they're scholarship athletes. 
that they didn't really necessarily want to watch it and be, you know, sort of around it all the time. So they did have fan identities. Like they had certain teams they liked and they had players that they liked. So I, I wonder what happens if something changes as athletes realize that like, you know, holy cow, like I am going to be a professional uh, because I do think that players like Jack Eichel and I mean, Connor McDavid, these other major stars in the league, they talk openly about players they watched and emulated as a kid. Mm-hmm. And so I do think their fan identity exists. I think some are better than others at hiding it. Uh, I'll give you a couple examples of players who are outward about their fan identity, though, and it kind of came back to bite them. And I think uh, this could be lumped in. I mean, we may need for this project, you know, we might need to bring in like a strategic com person um, <laughs> because like, there is something to be said about athletes who tweet about or talk about their fandom publicly on social media. This is going back to your social media point, by the way. Uh, so I'll give you the example first. So a few years ago, uh, the Boston Bruins drafted an amazing number one defenseman named Charlie McAvoy in like their top 15 in the first round. Uh, Charlie McAvoy is from Long Beach, Long Island, where I went to high school. Uh, I have friends who are friends with him. And he, uh, ironically, he got drafted by the Boston Bruins. He went to go play for Boston University, which is like one of these major uh, ice, NCAA ice hockey teams. Um, when he was younger, however, um, back to your social media point, he goes, uh, he tweeted something along the lines of like, the Boston Bruins suck. And of course, that's the team that drafted him. Um, so what are the fans doing? Because they're smart and, you know, the internet never loses. People started printing out three by five size posters that say the Boston Bruins suck. They started printing out his tweets to show at the games um, or he, and cause he grew up a Rangers fan. So Rangers and Bruins, big rivals. Um, so ironically his youthful fan identity um, <laughs> didn't necessarily get in the way because no one is denying that he's an amazing player and he went into his Boston identity uh, and he may be there his whole career but uh, at some point, players become more aware that they should not be maybe externally tweeting about teams, but the players matter. Maybe they mm-hmm. can talk about players who they emulate. So it's different to say as a defenseman, he's a defenseman. Wow, you know, Bobby Orr is an amazing defenseman. There's no denying his Hall of Fame greatness. uh, And I follow him as an athlete, even though I'm not a fan of his team. Mm. So I think we go back to this idea that players are, can somehow, some way be excluded from their team, which is hard to do, but I think players and fans uh, can do that. I I can do that. Uh, I don't think that's a special power. I think just a personality thing. Like I could be fans of individual players even though they're not on my favorite team. Yeah. Uh, And I think athletes can do that as well. But I would love to examine how athlete fan identity changes. And now going back to your point and where I think I maybe share characteristic with an athlete, um, uh, Annalise asking me the hard questions about (laughs) where my fan identity lies. Um, So, and I think this is how many athletes may think, currently my check is signed by Clemson University. Mm -hmm. So, and I think athletes may think that similarly because it's easier to compartmentalize identity with that. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, someone like Charlie McAvoy may be like, hey, I'm a huge Ranger fan, but the Bruins are paying me X millions of dollars. Go (laughs) Bruins. So, and also I think, you know, he loved the city. He played in Boston for college anyways, but he was still a Rangers fan and his family's from Long Beach. His family are notorious Ranger fans. Um, So I think, uh, you know, I think it depends. I think money is a huge factor. I think one's ability to connect and disconnect uh, is is something that's a a personal ability. And I think fans appreciate that. And I think fans appreciate genuine transparency. So it'd be different. He came in and he was like pounding this New York Rangers drum while being a Boston Bruin, but he doesn't. He -hmm. came in and he genuinely accepted the Boston uh, area and the Boston Bruins and his teammates and, I mean, they have a very happy relationship and he just got signed to a Mondo contract a couple of years ago. And he's one of the best defensemen in the league. Boston's not giving him up anytime soon. And I don't know why he would want to go anywhere else because the team is also good, which is, I'm glad I thought about that last second. Cause I think that also matters because that's what happened with Jack Eichel. The team yeah. is very bad. It's hard for him to digest being on a losing team, even mm-hmm. though he was getting paid a lot of money. So I, again, these are the variables that we're going to need to consider when we're doing this project, y'all. 
<laughs> is that we need to we need to think about the money they're being paid, their youthful interest, players they watch, the their current success they've had with the team. I think these things all all play, but uh, I think athletes, professionals, and also NCAA, but I think professionals mostly are good at compartmentalizing their uh, their interest and their motivations to where their success, their money, and their career are. But hey, it's okay. still Roll Tide for life, so let's, there just, let's not get confused. There go. <laughs> okay, so I have another follow-up question, and we're probably going to have to have a, you know, a Sam and King part two yeah. later on in the <laughs> season, just because there are so many. You had mentioned something earlier about the way individuals often, especially young kids, kind of look up to athletes, and they put them on a pedestal they um idealize them they you know because they see what they're doing and they're seeing these successes and something else that you had said something else you had referenced was sort of the way athletes kind of recently have been more public about social issues or things like mental health so what i'm wondering is if you look at the last few years with Black Lives Matter and, and COVID and, and pushing vaccinations for COVID and issues related to mental health, do you think that we're at a point now where the athlete's voice can be more powerful than what we're getting from other, other outlets? Because I feel like, you know, when... Um, when Naomi Osaka and Simone Biles were referencing mental health, it was something that we had heard a couple of years before with some athletes, but it really kind of elevated it to this platform where it's like, okay, this is something that we all need to be listening to and paying attention to. What do you think about all that? I think it's great. I think it's great that athletes are standing up for what they believe in and that they're being social about it. Um, You know, I, I have friends who disagree with me for, you know, more traditional sport reasons, you know, they want to enjoy it. It's an escapism. Uh, it's entertaining. It's aesthetically pleasing to watch athletes do what they do. But I think the contribution that athletes are making to like these pro-social movements and issues are, I think it's important. I mean, we let CEOs from corporations express their opinions. Why can't we let athletes express their opinions? Mm-hmm. I mean, I would argue that athletes have bigger reach. They're more impactful. People know them more readily than CEOs. I mean, you know, I'm sure we all know the, the, the regular CEOs, the Mark Zuckerberg, the, the Jeffrey Bezos. But, you know, I would argue that a lot of that knowledge is limited for most people when it comes to ownership. But for some reason, we still let those people have free reign. Um, so I think athletes speaking up for what they believe in is important. And um, I think hearing it firsthand from athletes makes it that much more real and that much more genuine. Yeah. You know, it's different when fans are like, hey, when fans say athletes are experiencing mental health concerns uh you know it's one thing for fans to say that but it's another thing for you know naomi osaka to say i'm backing out of this because the media is causing me mental health uh issues and Mm -hmm. they're being you know uh, they're they're acting negatively towards me they're having media misbehaviors um i think it's different when it comes from the athlete it has a a large sense of genuine uh genuineness It's, it's autonomous they're speaking on their own accord so they must feel passionate because they know the risks they're taking when they start to talk about this. They know okay. it's a, that disclosure is so tough. I mean, it's yeah. hard to disclose these issues and not be an athlete. So right. imagine right. now being someone on the spotlight on a major stage like the French Open or Wimbledon or the Olympics and saying something like that. It's incredibly scary to do that. So, you know, I give them a lot of credit for what they do and uh, it's hard to speak up, but they – and I say they, like athletes have single-handedly um, made stuff, made topics like mental health more approachable for people like me, um, more approachable for my friends. So it's so important that they speak their mind and they're entitled to it. You know, just because you're an athlete doesn't mean you don't have that freedom of speech anymore. Right. Um, and going back to this idea of like this level of trust we have with athletes, I think uh, obviously it, it comes with this idea of like they're speaking on behalf of themselves. But I think we live in a society, and this is like salient to me because I was working on a PowerPoint for a project with uh, Dr. Sean, uh, Sean Sadry and Andy Billings, and we talk about this sort of media skepticism that we have this larger uh, this larger lack of trust with uh, traditional media sources, and obviously, you know, it's been said in the past that we should be weary of 
people who write opinion pieces or blog posts, you know, these are not the most uh, informed individuals, but I think as a society, as a culture, we've had a hard time trusting media. Um, so hearing it from the athlete firsthand just kind of gives us that really clear, really passionate insight. Yes. So we're yeah. going to wrap up, but first, Dan Marino, if you're listening <laughs> oh, God. or not so six degrees of separation, any of our listeners, if you know Dan Marino. <laughs> I want to have a sit down. I want to talk to him. <laughs> we've got to make connection through the podcast. So Sam, <laughs> wrap up. Um, one more question as we hope we're getting back to more in-person um, events and conferences. Where and where are you looking forward to going? What academic conference are you looking forward to attending in the future, hopefully soon in person? Cool. So uh, I'm excited for the in-person conferences to come back to us. Uh, it's definitely something that I missed. Um, obviously I think I'm looking forward to NCA. Unfortunately, I won't be in Seattle this year, just sort of timing with the wedding, uh, and just like, you know, some funding things, but, uh, I'm excited to be at NCA next year. I plan on being there, but I'm also Southern for, uh, also excited for some of the smaller regional conferences like Southern. I know UA has always got a preference there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it'll be nice to see some familiar faces, but I'm really sad that I won't be at NCA this year because uh, I know a lot of UA folks are going to be there and it'd be a nice chance to reconnect. But that's the one I'm probably looking forward to the most. I'm um, just like trying to put some stuff together for the NCA deadline. But I feel like in traditional Sam Hockey fashion, you could find me working towards the deadline on that one. <laughs> um, NCA is definitely what I'm looking at and eyeballing the most. Nice. Sam, it has been so much fun catching up with you today. I know you have a lot going on today. Um Considering you're getting married tomorrow. So Woo! thank you for Woo! making the time in your schedule to to catch up with us. Absolutely. Thank you both so much for having me on. It was an honor and a pleasure. And uh, I'm so happy y'all are doing these podcasts because it really does keep the the community and the family feel. And it's nice to know what other people are up to and learn more about this family, this academic family tree that we have. So thank you so much for inviting me on. All right. Thanks. Thanks.